you know, we talked about uh, some of the potential like challenges. We've talked about technology. We've talked about uh, some of the challenges in terms of getting enough qualified personnel because you can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have the qualified personnel, then you have issues in, in the coming decades. Uh, the other thing that we have just mentioned very briefly, and you, you alluded to it, Michael, and I want to get to this before we close because it is a game changer, shale. What impact is shale going to have, in your estimation, on the offshore industry? Because PwC did a study, it was fascinating in terms of what they found. Now, the, the base case for the IEA in terms of oil in 2035 is $127 a barrel. But Michael, what happens because of shale and if OPEC doesn't contain uh, supply? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that there's always a mix between onshore, offshore, conventional, and unconventional. So things will change, but it's not just shale. So it is a mix, that's important to say. Um, if you look at where hydrocarbons are in the world, all the basins, essentially there's a source rock, and that source rock is where the oil comes from, and it, there tends to be shale in those same places, which is where the source rock is. So we did a, uh, a simple study looking at different geologies around the world, taking a number, a number of studies and applying a 1% recovery. So if you've got 1% of that oil out, um, actually, there, there's plenty of shale oil around the world. So it's not really how much is there, it's the rate at which you can extract it. So applying some limitations, looking at the US experience, and then playing that out around the rest of the world, what happens? Well, you get a lot of cheaper oil coming onto the market. And it's just a case of when it comes off on and what it displaces. So if you have very, I call it expensive oil, say we'll, we'll, we'll say, uh, above $80 per barrel, maybe the, the tar sands where you have very physical activities to get it out, that starts to become uncompetitive. You layer on top the OPEC supply, they, they, they get squeezed and um, th they've got a choice. Do they produce more or do they accept less revenue? If they produce more, that has an uh, increased pressure on oil price. So you add these things together and actually you can see some scenarios where oil price gets to about $80 per barrel, squeezing out the higher cost margin. So potentially a 40% drop from the base case scenario in 2035. If that were to happen, what's the ramifications for this, this industry and for all you people in it? Yeah, Andy, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I don't think we kind of agree that, that we do think unconventional is an enormous opportunity, but you know, energy demand, we believe, will double between now and 2060, right? With the emerging world particularly driving that. You look at China, we estimate between now and 2030, China will have five-fold increase in gas. So we're very busy in, in unlocking unconventional gas in China, but we don't believe that's going to be anywhere enough to fuel its energy demand increase. So we do think there will be a lot of additional resources, but we also believe the demand in many places will outpace uh, the ability to supply. Do you worry at all about the impact of, of shale on, on your pricing and so forth? I think it's great that the world is finding more energy. Uh, so that's a positive thing generally um, with regard to the oil price uh, going forward. Uh, we can only guess uh, what it will be, but our feeling uh, and our plans are based on it being uh, on the weak side, not uh, on the upside. However, I your question was what will happen if it really falls? Exactly. And then we have to actually cut our cost. And that's what every other in industry, that's the natural dynamics. And uh, it, it personnel is a very, very important thing. Uh, it's the most important, uh, the cost of personnel. There's more to be, to be done there. I'm not sure we have enough engineers in the, in, in the, in the world, as you say, um, but we certainly uh, hire them anywhere in the world. But also the supply chain. Uh, I have a little story from uh, uh, recently where I uh, visited a manufacturer who was supplying the land-based conventional industry and the offshore industry. Their margin to the offshore industry was three times for the same product that they were selling onshore. Are we tough enough with them, or what is it? It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So I think that begs... Uh, uh, sorry, Remy, you wanted to... Yeah, yeah and, and I think the extraction of, uh, of uh, unconventionalists are positive, but I think the short term we will see uh, uh, rejuvenation of the U.S. I think it will be good for the U.S. economy yeah. because there will be more uh, oil and gas. Uh, self-sufficient, and there will be some change in, in trade routes. But in terms of short term, I, I don't think there will be a major impact. Well, I think it's, uh, we can analyze it as much as we want. When, when uh, the world's largest energy consumer all of a sudden becomes insufficient or is self-sufficient, 
and they meet their optimal goal, and that is becoming independent of the Middle East, it will have implications. And I think if you look at the geopolitical implications of it, uh, and the potential of what will happen in the control of the oil price and the discipline in OPEC, you know, it's anybody's guess. But that it will have implication, I think we can be sure about. You know, one of the things uh, Helge talked about, and we mentioned this earlier, was that you're going to have to become more cost efficient through the entire supply chain. So that's for everyone sitting in this audience as well as standing uh, here. If he is right, and you know, will five years from now, 10 years from now, the margins between the offshore and the onshore, will they shrink? And will the smart operators realize that they are going to have to shrink uh, and become more cost competitive very quickly, Irene? I think indeed we have to, yeah. You, yeah. Yes, right. we have done that. Yep. Right. Let me comment uh, on the practical side. When you, you look at the maritime industry, the way we work today, we order a vessel, and the, the, the vessel has a 35-year life. We get a one-year guarantee. If you buy a car, a washing machine, you get a five-year guarantee. <laughs> uh, we need to get the supply chain much more involved and have a stake in the game for this equipment to, to uh, function over a long period of time. And that's where the cooperation in the, with the supply chain has to improve. Uh, today, the shipyard orders it, and uh, we are the client, on the other hand, buying the, the vessel. A year later, everybody takes a sigh of relief, and uh, we sit there and hold the baby. We are not sure they have these spare parts. We are not sure that we have uh, fixed prices uh, on, on the spare parts. And we don't have uh, the, the um, cooperation with the supply chain to actually maintain and assure the functionality of this equipment. That's the potential. Yeah, Ivor, you want to make a quick comment, then, uh, Michael? Yeah. Uh, um, quite honestly, I think that uh, co cutting costs, cutting costs, cutting costs is just more like a buzzword than reality. Our industry is the cost-heavy uh, cost industry. It's going to be that in the future it's really dependent on technology development, etc., etc. That has a high cost impact. And the energy, carrier, energy carriers, such as oil and gas, and particularly oil, will have to be priced high. Michael. Yeah, I, I think it comes back to business models and risk sharing. If you try and run a business on a utilization of assets and you don't have visit forward visibility of the use of those over a couple of years, that's a really difficult business to manage. So I, I think it's uh, longer contracts, it's greater risk sharing, um, and, and, I, and I, th I think that can itself drive price down costs. Andy. Yeah, so we are seeing an increase in, in costs, particularly in the deep water and rig rates and other things, and you know, that is an issue for our industry. And one of the solutions is this working together, and I think we need to, to do that urgently, because companies like Shell have unconventional sources to invest in, integrated gas, and deep water. And to attract the money still into the business, let it grow, then we're going to have to work smarter together. Working smarter together. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. Fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.